can I get confirmation? We also have a new way of playing Fed over here on the side, so hopefully I'll be able to see it a little better. Uh, if I drop it down, there we go. Um, sadly, this, the side camera is out of commission for a day, so uh, we're gonna have to deal with that, but that should be fine. And it is, man, it is still confusing to be watching myself with like a 10 second delay on a side screen. Okay. Um, so today we are going to be uh, going forward with more of the Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes project. Um, for those of you who don't know, this has been a project I've been working on for almost a year now, uh, on and off. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with the game, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes is a game in which uh, one player, the diffuser, uh, attempts to diffuse a virtual bomb, although in this case we are building a real, uh, obviously not actually functional explosive uh, but a mock or prop bomb, uh, uh, they try to defuse it while the instruction manual is entirely in the possession of someone who they cannot see and who must describe to them how to defuse it. And I think I have a copy of the manual somewhere around here. Uh, not sure where it went. But um, I might actually have to go get that in order to continue later on. But uh, we're going to start out, hopefully, by working on the module Simon. Uh, well, first, we're going to have to revise the module itself. So a module, in its essence, looks something like this. Um, so mine are fairly large. They're 15 millimeters across. Uh, this was the very first mock-up I made, just the four buttons of the generic module um, that is used as a demo module in the actual dev code. Um, but it is the same, uh, to my knowledge, as the keypad module. But then uh, what I need to do a revision of is the first uh, ready version of it. So this version, uh, the idea is actually fits into the metal frames I'll be using and pops out via magnets so these are modular. Um, the issue, and I think it's going to be visible here, or maybe not, uh, it's just barely visible, is that the magnets in here are very, very close to the surface of, the mod of this uh, print whereas they are not on the actual uh, module itself. And again, it's kind of hard to see due to my lighting, uh, but you can see there's no visible artifact there. It's clean here. So this isn't centered. I would like it to be uh, for the longevity of the print because while this snaps in really nicely, um, maybe too nicely, it's actually very strongly attached when it's in. Um, it isn't quite uh, how I'd like it to work. Um, also, this weird effect where there's like lines of different colors going across that has been solved recently, so that should no longer be an issue, which will be nice. Um, so, that being said, uh, we can, the module we're actually going to try to model after we fix that one issue will be Simon. Uh, I have here, of course, the Simon module uh, with its yellow, red, and uh, well, blue and green buttons, but they're entirely invisible on the green screen. So, um, yeah, the, trust me, they are blue and green. <laughs> um, but at the moment, they will just appear invisible. Uh, very invisible. It's, it's very reliably invisible. Um, but, yeah, so uh, yellow, red. This one's the green one. This one's the blue one. They're both the same color. Uh, they're both invisible. Um as is my drink, just everything vaguely close uh, will end up completely invisible on this, but that's kind of convenient. Um, so, uh, let me switch over to the Fusion View. Um, so this is the module I have been working on. Uh, this is the, the furthest along version of it. Um, there is still the original module, what I called module test which was just basically a replication of the in-game uh, model. I think this one might even have, yep. Um, this one actually has the original um, geometry from the game uh, because I ripped most of the models out of the game. Um, so you can see the original model, not a very complex model. And of course, like all game models, uh, basically most of it doesn't exist. Um, this is very common practice in game modeling to just completely ignore every face that isn't meant to be visible to a player. 
Uh, so these are not terribly useful for 3D printing, which is the goal with this project. So I went through and basically modeled uh, as I saw it. So you can see there are some weird things here. This geometry isn't quite the same. My tabs come out further than the ones in-game. Um, in almost all cases. Uh, but all of that is just to, one thing, make this more geometrically reasonable. Um, the one in game is very low poly and some of the features like this don't really follow any uh, visible rhyme or reason as to the geometry here. Um, it just kind of squishes in a general shape. So in redesigning the module, I took it all into perfect geometry, which is maybe not what really is meant to be in game, but felt more appropriate for the modeling. Also makes my job much easier uh, when I'm designing to have a perfect geometry to a part. Uh, and I added a little light bulb. So that was the revision one. I uh, will save that. Then I did do a test, uh, the one here. So the printed module I have here is the module here. They're the same model. Um, and this was just a test to see how does this feel in my hands. Um, uh, hello, Cool Doom. Um, so I, I'm the kind of person who likes to have a real size and get an idea of how something kind of feels in presence. Uh, CAD. I can have it be gigantic and I can have it be tiny and there is no, uh, even though I can see a dimension on screen, there's no real uh, understanding of how big something is. So did a print to kind of get an idea of it. And I was pretty happy with this size, so I went forward with it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I wonder if I can kind of, let's see if I can, how good I can get them next to each other here. Uh, oh, there we go. I kind of like scoot it. That is mirrored now that I realize it. Um, my camera is mirrored because it looks better in the corner. But other than that, <laughs> yeah, you can kind of see the, the same model. Oh, let me make it not glow. Um, so, yeah, I was very happy with how that came out. And so I went forward and made the version 3. Um, <laughs> Actually, uh, I th it is almost the same as if it's rotated. Like, if I rotate this 90 degrees, um, yeah, the only difference is that this little tab that connects the uh, the round module. Let's see, yep, there you go. The little tab there is the only thing that's geometrically out of place. Um, that is a change I made intentionally. Um, the original game model actually has that circle be ever so slightly off-center. I believe it's slightly lower than on-center. Um, but I, w I wanted it to be geometrically in the corner, so kind of took a little bit of uh, liberty on that and made it actually in the corner. <laughs> Evening. How's it going? Um... And I have my symbol on there because I wanted something to be on the face when I printed it again. Uh, the other difference you'll see here is there's actually an LED in this corner. Uh, there's not a cover on it right now. Um, that was a change that was modeled into this version. So if I take away the bulb, you can see there's actually a hole with a backing there that allows a wire to be run through there and all the way back out and through the bottom here. Um, so that an actual uh, LED could be put there. Because um, in game, this is the indicator light for whether something is solved or not. So, uh, I guess thing number one we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to make these two uh, ever so slightly more on center from each other. Um, it'll be a tiny change uh, to the internal geometry. Whoopsie. And there goes the pile of parts I have over beside my desk. Just a moment. Okay, we're all fine. <laughs> uh, textbook. I keep way too many textbooks next to my desk here. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the uh, hole on this is perfectly square. Um, <laughs> the bulb is a big status light. Hmm, 
I mean, you're not exactly wrong. <laughs> um, I'm guessing Cool Doom is referring to the mo the modded module that is actually called the bulb, which is a humongous bulb right in the middle. Uh, kind of looks like if I was to um, do I have one of them sitting here? Ah, I do have one. Yeah. There we go. I got your IRL the bulb module. <laughs> Basically that. Um, also, I think this bulb is too small. I think the bulbs used in the in size for the game would be bigger. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we're going to try to fix up that locking module, and then we're going to move on to making Simon. Um, and realistically, not much will need to be done for Simon. I already have a panel uh, that is this test panel I designed. So the piece that these are fitting into uh, is already modeled and sized appropriately because I was testing. Um, I like to run little tests like this to make sure everything fits the way I want it to before I actually go designing a whole module. So we'll just have to copy that geometry over. Holy purple opaque. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, yeah, the, the bulb is one of the modules I do want to do once I've cr created the majority of the, uh, original in-game modules um but uh, uh it's, it's going to be a lot of parts at that point because the bulb has many many more solutions than most of the vanilla modules um if i remember correctly it has something like i think we did the math and it was something like four or five times as many uh physical parts would be needed compared to the traditional modules um because what when you break down the rules of keep talking nobody explodes the vanilla version of the game uh, it's a lot less complicated than, uh, like, I, it, when you're playing it, you don't think about it, but it's actually not all that bad. There's only 16 possible buttons in the button, which is another module we can do at some point. I have a button. Um, <laughs> so we might get around to the button. Uh, we'll see. Uh, or we might do keypads. Unless somehow magnets... Hmm, I've considered magnets. Uh, some of the modules already use them, but uh, magnets are... I actually prefer magnets to springs in a lot of cases just because of their uh, tendency to not wear out, I guess I'll say, or get stuck. Um, but, yeah. Wait, what, what, what module? Oh, Ultra Stories, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's only a few modules, a lot of modules, especially from, a, well, we've determined that there's only one or two modules from the original game that are uh, impossible in the way they're shown. Um, as an example, uh, memory has buttons that change physically, which would be impossible, um, at least with current technology as it is. We don't have e-paper displays that are on the faces of buttons that also don't look like e-paper displays. Um but almost everything, everything in game is possible. But when it gets to the modded community, uh, it, all, all bets are off. Um, so I can show what I'm talking about here real quick. Uh, let's, I'll start working on this while we're talking. Um, so if I bring up a section analysis and cut into this model, so you can see these are the two slots where the magnets live. Um, one magnet right here uh, and these are bar magnets these uh, slots actually go very far back in the model as you can see they make up uh, a very large area there uh, they're quite deep um, and the bar magnet itself does not take up this weird little corner that is just to make it more printable um, <laughs> and I, I think I have some of these magnets here um, yeah, I do. oh goodness these are some of the strongest magnets I've been able to come across. Uh, I have a lot of them, and they terrify me when they're in a pile like this. I keep them away from metal um, <laughs> due to their ability to, like, just immediately pick up anything from several inches away. Um, <laughs> uh, they do make excellent stud finders. If you have a metal, metal studs like in our apartment, you can just go along the wall and you'll just feel every stud. In fact, these stick to the wall, even this whole pile. Um, so 
yeah, these are the magnets I use. Um, <laughs> just leave them over there. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, put a, I put a bar magnet in one. Uh, the reason for this weird little gap there um, is that bar magnet will fit across this gap, and then it basically can print over top. So when it comes to the actual mo uh, modules I've printed, you can see there is no opening in any of these parts. The magnets are actually inside of it. Um, I really need to do something to make them not as wobbly sounding. Um, probably just put some putty or something in them. Uh, but due to the fact that they're embedded, uh, there's no way for them to fall out. I don't have to deal with them sticking to things I don't want them to stick to. They can't get flipped over. Um, so it just kind of works out to have them embedded in parts. Also makes them, uh, it makes so I don't have to glue to them. And I have yet to find a glue that can hold against these magnets for long periods of time. Uh, so that also helps. You kind of need a physical constraint with magnets like these. Um, so, let's put that back. I think optimally, uh, so you can kind of see what I mean here. This is much thinner than this surface here. Uh, oops, let me go. <laughs> is that the one with the cube floating off the surface at like a 45 degree angle? Because I know quite a few use that mechanic. I think Rubik, one of the Rubik's Cube does too. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess in theory you could like connect a cube and do something fancy with it, but it's the one with the box. Ah. Uh, think our oh goodness it's been so long since I've messed with modded modules now um, you know the more I look at it, though I don't know how I'm fitting this magnet anywhere else I mean I think that I th if I remember correctly when I made the construction here and I can check my my geometry here if I go into the sketches um, yes there's a lot of stuff in this um, find the spot in the future tree nope 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 Nope. It's somewhere in here. Actually, it might be further down. Uh, oh, wait. It's, it's invisible because of section analysis. Whoops. Let me turn off that. There we go. So somewhere in here, there is a sketch that is the profile of the magnet cut. I think there it is um, really I just did one sketch for this whole thing Wow um, yeah so in this sketch this is kind of the issue is I can't go much further uh, in or out here I can only go down so I could weaken the magnet a bit by moving this down and in theory that could help but I might actually just work out a better way to print this um, Given that one space and cube symbol, um, I'm gonna have to look it up real quick on the side to remember. Oh, that one. That that's what you meant by the cube. Ah, yes. Um. Yeah, not going to happen for a while. <laughs> um, for anyone who's wondering, uh, yeah, the cube looks like that. Um, with a rotating and tons of symbols, yeah. That, that's probably not going to happen in this project for a while. <laughs> um, not saying it won't happen. I mean, you can do some crazy stuff here, but... Uh, yeah, we're going to probably keep with the vanilla vanilla for a while. So I actually think that that looks pretty good. Uh, I'm going to keep that. The thing I am going to do is I'm going to get rid of this uh, symbol on the surface, which I think I can do by just reverting that feature. Um, so I'm going to suppress the feature that makes that. Um, because that is the term we use for it. If I can find it. Uh, sketch 9. We're looking for sketch 30. 
31. That's 13. I don't know why that's there. 28. So you're like entirely out of order. Not that it's surprising that happens. Uh, 25, 26, 28, 29, 31. Where did sketch 30 go? Actually, what I should be able to do is I should be able to click this and it'll mark it in my feature tree. There we go. Okay, found the feature. So this feature is the one that creates that extrude, and I'm guessing this is what chamfers it. So, yep, there's a chamfer. So I should be able to suppress this chamfer and then suppress the extrude. And we have a fresh module. I'm going to save this, and I'm going to make a copy. I, I work with them like I'm in the, the discord for keep talking nobody explodes and the modded community there is so active I don't think it would be possible to ever catch up with them um, but we have considered making uh, physical only modules um, because we can uh, like things that would re rely on tactile feedback or um, just tiny elements that you can't actually normally use could be pretty interesting um, so I'm going to make a copy here and the rename it. I'm going to rename it. Simon. And open that. Yeah, Braille, Braille would be a cool module to do. Um, I, I've messed with it a little bit because I, I also had the idea. Um, I can't read it well but I've tried to learn in the past and oh goodness Braille is uh, hard to create with a like just the, the, the size of those actuators to actually have it match real rail standards they are tiny um, and, and it's, and it's a, like an active thing that's being currently in development is there's tons of companies trying to create affordable and small titleable uh, physical displays for Braille and it is tough. Um, there's some ways to do it by basically like chaining actuators and having them uh, trigger and fall based on the rotation of cams, which is already complicated sounding. It's even worse when you try to like actually get into it, but it basically has to do with uh, using mo like a two or three motors instead of one per pin. And you can control a whole array uh, by selectively a lot like it's basically the same thing as when you have an LED matrix and you're uh, turning on both a vertical and a horizontal at the same time in order to target a specific point. You can do that physically with like rotating cam arrays, uh, but it's beyond what I am able to think about <laughs> in my head. Um, so maybe if a standard design kind of gets around, I might try to include in one of these modules. But uh, we can do Simon. So let me grab. So we have our actual panel for Simon, and I know this is good. I also know it only has four features, which is convenient. Um, so we can actually use this as a reference for Simon. Um, and I know Simon's going to be a little small on this surface compared to in-game. Um, partly because I believe that the buttons I'm using, these are, I believe, 44 millimeter buttons work a little better on like 13 to 14 millimeter modules compared to my 15 millimeters. Um, I do have larger buttons, but they are extremely specialty. Apparently only like, these are standard arcade button cabinets. They're pre or, uh, arcade button cabinets. Arcade cabinet buttons um, that are pretty easy to get a hold of, these 44 millimeter ones. Um, they make 50 millimeter ones. Uh, I think I'm thinking about the sizes right. Uh, that are better for this size, but they take about two months from China on a good day, good week, month, whatever. Um, it took over four months or uh, over two months for me to get mine, and they sent the wrong colors. So <laughs> um, after that, I gave up on those buttons, and I'm just going to use these ones for now. Uh, I spaced them out a little bit. The ones in game are not spaced, and they create a pretty satisfying array like this, so I'm good with that gonna keep I'm just gonna do that <laughs> um, so 
uh, I'm going to create a sketch on the surface. I'm probably going to center this dead center, but I don't know if I want to commit to that yet. Um, hmm. I'm not sure if dead center is where is the best place for this. Let me, let me look at a picture of the module real quick. Because I know that the... Um, The module is close to centered, but like all things in the game, might be slightly off. Uh, nope, nope. Okay, it is dead centered. Uh, the one in game is edge to edge and exactly centered within the tabs. Um, as you can see there, it's completely centered. So we're good to center this. I don't think it'll look weird. So given that, uh, we are going to have to make this on the diagonal, but... Uh, the important dimensions are here, so we have, uh, looks like our, I'm double check, yeah, okay, so our holes are 29.25, and our, or, sorry, our square holes are 29.25, our round holes are 24.5, and I have a border that says 33, I believe that, oh goodness, confusing perspective, um, I believe that 33 is uh, the outer lip of these. Um, so the way these, uh, and I can, let me swap cameras here so you can get a better view. Uh, the way these modules are set up, these little buttons, uh, there is a lower component that contains the actual button and LED assembly. So there's an LED up top, and that, is, that gets powered through these two side uh, contacts. And then there's an actual switch beneath that uh, that gets these two contacts. And you can actually see the button, the little clicky button, is right here on the side. Yep, they light up. And so this kind of fits in and clicks. Um, you can see how they're kind of arrayed in the version I have here to barely fit. <laughs> um, but with that out, the actual button... Um, as it's originally intended, I'm, I'm not sure why they include this little bit here, but there's just a plastic cover on the end that I guess is for alignment. Um, I have that removed on mine. And so that allows them to sit completely flush with the surface um, like that, instead of having to stick up above it. So I think that I feel like this looks a little better, having them completely flush. So that's what I'm going to be modeling is based off of. But it means there's little pockets beneath the buttons for that uh, little lip to fit into. So the, li the lip, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, this first edge fits down in, whereas the second edge overlaps. Uh, so uh, I believe that 33 is the outer edge. So that, sorry, these are, yeah, so these are, I guess, 33 millimeter buttons, uh, not 44. 44 is the big ones. Um, so we have our number, yep, so 29.25, and uh, looks like I spaced these roughly, okay, what dimension did I use to space them? There's got to be one here somewhere. Uh, or did I just pick an outer dimension? Rotary pattern. No, sorry, that's a rectangular. Ah, okay, so it's in, it's within the rectangular pattern. Uh, whatever 33 plus 5 is, got it. <laughs> Not sure why I decided that on the spacing, but that's the one we'll go with. So, uh, I guess I'll put the first one up here. Um, so, uh, the, the one annoying thing here is that we can't just use a rectangle tool like we normally would, uh, because... Rectangles are naturally uh, aligned to the horizontal axis. I think if I delete the one, okay, I can delete the one dimension and actually get them to rotate now. Although it's not a particularly elegant rotation. Um, so I should be able to constrain these and there we go. So I don't believe this is a, is this a square? Okay, it is a square. So we have that. Uh, I am going to center it using a construction line to be vertically centered. I uh, did not want that to be parallel. Um, in general, 
the hierarchy of constraints, uh, it's best to have things be related to a universal. So I'm going to use the horizontal vertical constraint instead of the. Uh, uh, what was that? Ah, goodness, you're right. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I I see everything here, so it's hard to remember sometimes that I uh, so I haven't hit the button yet. Goodness, you guys didn't see any of that, did you? Um, yeah, sorry. This is the uh, constraint here. So this is what this is the original template uh, with 29.25 being the width. Um, and so this is what we're basing it off of. This is what fits uh, this one. And apparently Fusion is angry at me. Um, <laughs> so uh, we know that size should be 29.25. And that. There we go. And it still wants me. To, I haven't set a vertical, so it's still moving freely there. Um, the issue is we actually spaced these, so I believe the dimension is that from here to here, yeah, is 38. Um, but that's not a useful dimension. We need to know the uh, corner di dimension. So, and this may mean that things are a little weird, but I'm gonna try dimensioning from here to here. Yes, yeah, so that's like 12.374. Um, we can't really dimension that. So I'm gonna dimension it as, uh, let's see, 12.374, so maybe, Hmm. So I want them to be further apart. Uh, we'll go with 12.5 and we'll see what that looks like when we finish. Uh, we also need the circular holes, which are 24.5 in diameter. So I do not want to do construction. Check that, 24.5, 24.5, okay. So there's our uh, single. Let's see. Uh, what is the margin of error on my printer? Uh, 0.15 millimeters, generally. Um, this, I know that these measurements are perfect because uh, I tested them. Uh, and so since this fit, I'm just going to go with them. Um, I have a feeling when I initially measured this, I probably added in a margin as I was measuring, um, which isn't the best practice. Sometimes it's better to do it by, um, like actually writing in a margin of error into your, uh, parameters so you can change it later. Um, but in this case, I just went with it. So I'm going to create a, where did it go? Create create a circular pattern here. I'm gonna rotate this rectangle and that circle around here and make four of them. I wanna make sure that's not construction geometry. Okay, so there's our four buttons. And they maybe do look a little spaced out here now I'm looking at them. Um, I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna add in the uh, outer boundary we had in this one. So this boundary here, this one that's, that's 33 wide, is the actual size of the uh, the correct size of the buttons as they're visible. So I'm going to add that. Uh, let's see, what's the best way to add that in? Um, hmm. I'm going to do it via construction geometry. I'm just going to draw it in. And you can see it's snapping by grabbing a perpendicular there. I think I'm going to try to rely on that. Uh, nope, okay, it doesn't want to do that. So instead, I'm just going to do a very wonky shape here. I'm going to get rid of that perpendicular. And instead, I'm going to use parallels. Um, so let's do... 
I realize this is probably almost invisible. Um, we're looking at like dark orange on gray, and so it's kind of going to be hard to see. Uh, it's hard for me to see as well. <laughs> okay, so we're pretty. We've got the whole thing paralleled up. Just need to add the actual dimension to play. It would be best if we can. I guess we'll just do this via construction lines. So I'm going to do one there. One there, one there, and one there. This horizontal, vertical, horizontal. Let's see if I can hit that dimension line. Vertical. Okay. And equal constraint. This equals this. Yeah, I didn't like that. Um, oh, they're already equal because of other geometric relationships. So uh, we should be able to just set this equal to 33. And there's our actual button size right over there. Uh, yep. Yeah, so that's the kind of fun thing with uh, geometric constraint modeling like this. Um, you can draw something super wonky and then just add constraints and it'll even out as you go. Um, I actually even find sometimes that works better because you don't accidentally get weird geometric constraints you didn't mean to assign at any point. Because um, that is definitely something that happens. <laughs> so I'm actually going to do two features. I'm going to do one with the construction, one without it. Because if I remember correctly, construction and non-construction geometry is overridden when you make a pattern. Um, so I'm going to have to make a second circular pattern and do the construction geometry. And center point for go. Okay, so we can kind of see the spacing here as to how they'll really look. And I'll probably add in mock buttons. We'll make those in a minute here. Just so we can really get an idea of what this looks like. But just from this, and I am going to hide the mounting piece so this is, looks even. Um, I kind of feel like this is going to look weird. Like it's going to be uh, closer to the edges. So I'm going to make this just a little smaller. Um, and for some reason, this does not match up with the original spacing. Oh, right. This isn't 12. Uh, this is six, I have a feeling. Which, or something close to that. Let me measure it. Measure. So what we want to measure is from here to here and divide that by two. Yeah, so it's actually six. Um, six point and a bit. So six. Yeah, much closer together now. So you can kind of see how it's a lot smaller than the one in game. Um, I might actually make that just a touch bigger then. Um, uh, no, I'll leave it. The uh, the, re the reason I'm leaving it that way is if you look at the module I have here, minus the invisible buttons, um, the gap, for the kind of black border, uh, this gap and that black border are kind of the same spacing, and I kind of like how that looks. Um, so I think I'm going to leave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the invisible button, so one of them is blue and one of them is green. I don't know why my green screen, even though it's very much not blue, uh, OBS, which is what I use for the, the stream, um, the open broadcasting suite, uh, really likes to make blue things invisible. So like this is invisible. Um, I've got like a blue printed part here. That's circuit component on it. That's invisible. Um, I've got a pen. Kind of purple invisible. That's interesting. That's not fully invisible. Um, got like a, a blue unnamed drink. Sure. Yeah, it's invisible. Um, <laughs> yeah, lo lots of things here are invisible. Speaking of uh, drink. <laughs> yeah, the, bo the board came out pretty well. This is just a prototype. It's literally a piece of plastic. Um, yeah, I've worn green shirts to it in this before, and it's just kind of creepy looking to have a floating head. So I don't, I don't generally wear the green shirts. I have one, but uh, it's just kind of creepy looking. <laughs> um, flo floating head with a bit of a neck is not uh, 
So I kind of, I don't know, like bunch up the shirt a little bit, make it like that. It kind of works, but. <laughs> but that's, it will be like bodiless Nick, though, not headless Nick. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a Harry Potter reference. Probably one of my favorite characters from the film version of the movie, actually, or from the films, actually. Just a good character. Doesn't have much screen time, but he's fun. Um. <laughs> okay, so this is fully constrained and ready. Um, I'm gonna have to hop back over to this and remember what I extruded things. So it looks like my initial extrude was. Oh, how do I do this? Let me just pop back in history. Ah, okay, so I made the, the holes the separate and then I raised it. So this is the important one. Looks like it's a five millimeter deep hole. So I'm gonna go ahead and extrude all of this. Oh, okay, uh, negative five. There's our slots for the buttons to fit into. And then I want that sketch back. I need to extrude those holes all the way through. Which is actually quite a distance. I might need to change that. Um, I'm gonna use the all modifier. And that, well, maybe that's not too bad. Uh, it looks like that's about 10 millimeters. I think that is exactly 10 millimeters. Um, turn off that sketch now. Um, I want to check here. So if I measure from this face to here. Oh, sorry, five millimeters. Uh, can't see the screen again. Sure enough, you can't. Goodness, I need to stop flipping that back. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. So what I just did was... Uh, Finished up that sketch. Uh, well, nothing changed on it, but there's the sketch back. And then I extruded the square parts down five millimeters and the circular parts all the way through. And what I want to check here really quick is, so this is five millimeters deep. This is another five, because this is a 10 millimeter thick uh, platform. So what I'm curious about is, okay, never mind. it's not a problem. Um, if you can see on the actual, I'm switching it, I'll make sure I switch it back this time. On the actual buttons, uh, there is a uh, like long cylinder that you can kind of screw a black plate into to connect it up to a module. Um, I was a little worried that, that would be a problem, but this is so long. I think I could have like a 20 millimeter thick platform easily. It wouldn't cause an issue. Um, the reason I worried is because on buttons like this, the distance from the front edge of the button to the back of the like uh, piece here is very small in comparison. So it matters a lot more for that. Um, but we are fine here. So technically this is about it. I'm going to go ahead and do the same chamfer as I made on the previous one. So it looks like I did a, um, let's see, uh, that one's irrelevant and I did a 0.5 millimeter chamfer around the squares. I'll go ahead and do that here. Um, click all the squares. I probably could do this a little easier with uh, a, a feature, but I'll just do a click. And there we go, 0.5. Okay. So technically that is Simon done, I guess. Um, yeah, that's Simon Dunn, um, but it doesn't really look like Simon, so I think it, we should add the buttons. I think we should go ahead and model those off the side and stick them in. Um, we won't model the whole thing, we'll just model the uh, actual um, kind of cap piece. Um, so we'll basically just be modeling this little cylinder with a cap. Uh, so... Let me grab my calipers, which are hiding from me. There they are. And 
my side camera's down today, so sadly I can't show the uh, what I'm doing here really. Um, but let's see here. I can kind of do it on oops, on screen. So there you go. So 33 millimeters wide. Uh, so what we'll actually model as we go. So um, we can say for certain uh, because we just modeled it for the other part that we start with a there are two squares one of them is the outer boundary one of them is the inner boundary like that uh, these are not squares yet now they are there we go we got our squares outer boundary is 33 millimeters which is actually a lot smaller than that <laughs> and the inner boundary is Twenty nine point two five. This probably isn't exactly that. It's probably a little smaller, but since they are primitive, we can make them whatever we want, and it'll still work. Uh, so I'm gonna finish that. Extrude the bottom down five millimeters. Down five millimeters. Um, I realize it's almost invisible now, so let me make it something else for the now time being. Make it colorful. We'll set back to black plastic like it really is, but uh, it's nice to have something easy to see. And do, 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 bring back the sketch. And we need to extrude this upward by uh, three point. About 3.8 millimeters. Um, we will turn off that sketch. And there is a chamfer in this case, so we have to do a little bit of math here to make this chamfer work. Uh, but that's fine. We'll put a chamfer there, and we're going to do two distances. Um, I'm going to put something in both of these so we can tell which one is which direction. So it looks like uh, this is our inward direction, this is our vertical direction. So our vertical direction is 3.8 minus 1.6. <laughs> um, because I was measuring the other surface, this is 1.6 here. And what kind of caliper am I using? Um, these are Vinci, uh, Vinsa, Vinsa brand calipers. Um, they were just the cheapest thing on Amazon, frankly, that looked decent. Um, I've had better luck with uh, the brand Neiko, um, which is another cheap brand off Amazon. Um, but they're roughly equivalent. Uh, basically, any digital caliper you'll get these days online uh, is, is good enough for 3D printing. Um, as long as it can hit, like, this one gives two, gives two decimals of millimeter. Uh, I don't trust the last decimal place of millimeter uh, heavily, I, but I generally consider it to be within 0.02 millimeters, so more than enough for 3D printing. Not Maybe not enough for calibrating or, like, machining. It's not a machinist's uh, measuring tool, but it's completely... Uh, good enough for 3d printing and i like the length of it um i have a much bigger one that i use for large projects but it's too unwieldy to hold in my hand like this so um i, I recommend the eight inch calipers to anyone who's looking to get into 3d printing they'll cover like 95 90 to 95 percent of what you'll do um I say eight inch because that's what they actually call it. It's I, It's realistically two hundred millimeters. Um, if you get the six inch, uh, you you'll have. I, I've run into issues with my six inch before, as to it not actually being able to represent the majority of the projects I work on. And I have a twelve inch, but it is humongous and unwieldy, and I almost never use it because of that. So I'd go eight inch. 
Um, not sure if it's still the case that there's a massive price hike on them. If there is, don't buy them. You should be able to get them for like probably 30 or less dollars realistically. I think last I checked, the, because of uh, like right around when school starts slash partway through semesters, depending on the uh, – lots of college students will start buying calipers. And uh, they'll get very expensive on places like Amazon where they're sold based on demand. So if they're like 45, 50 bucks on an eight inch pair of these cheaper ones, I'd just wait because um, it's not worth it to pay that much. Uh, there are good brands that'll cost a lot more. Like if you want to get real machinist calipers, you can spend 200 bucks easy. But on these cheap ones that don't have any like special specifications or anything, um, <laughs> Yeah, 2.3. Um. <laughs> oh, you say that, but like that's obviously a bit more than what I, I'm thinking. But you can you can find some like thousand dollar calipers in this range, definitely. Uh, like machine, machinist grade or like in uh, like scientific industry grade ones that have certifications and like repair schedules and all that stuff can get really expensive. Like good, uh, like Mitotoya comes to mind as one of the brands that's pretty expensive, but is probably worth it. Um, I know Machinists really like that brand. Uh, so they kind of got the shape for me here. We just got to add the actual cap of the button. Um, so I'm gonna draw on this surface, create. And it looks like the button cap size itself we want to go fancy with the button cap. Might be worth it to go fancy with the button cap. Get a, a nice look to it. Make it glow or something. Uh, we'll do that. So button cap is 24, 24.2. Yeah, 24.2 millimeters across. We'll do that. Uh, this should be equal. and the way we'll make this fancy is real buttons have a clear cap with a interior piece of plastic just one millimeter thick apparently so what we'll actually emulate that effect here so we'll finish that sketch um, I'm going to extrude this through the surface backward uh, and I'm, I'm going to leave a little bit of a gap here. So I'm going to go distance to object here. And I'm going to go back about uh, maybe two millimeters. Yeah, we'll go back two millimeters. So we have a pocket now that we can fit our button into. Then I'm going to extrude from here up uh, distance to object here. So basically I've recreated that same surface, but now I'm gonna add the extra height of the button, which is 2.8 millimeters off the surface. By the way, um, if you've ever wondered how to measure a surface that is raised off of another surface, and I'll zoom in for this. So if you ever wanna measure a surface that's raised off another surface, um, so this part measures interior surfaces. These little nib nubs on the top are for measuring an interior diameter. And if you want to measure the distance between two surfaces, so as an example, the top of this button and this little lip, you actually can use this little bit that sticks down. And so you'll rest one, the edge of your caliper on the upper surface, and that little peg will drop down into against the second part, like that. And you can get the measure, you can read off the caliper that way. So all the ends of the caliper are useful. And it is three millimeters. Um, I learned that way too late after owning a pair of calipers. And uh, yeah, knowing that makes things a lot easier. Um, we got our three millimeter. And instead of join, I'm actually going to do new body. So we have a button that is a separate body here. Um, what is not quite accurate 
it, well, there's a lot of things that aren't quite accurate right now. Um, one thing, all of these pieces here are rounded uh, because making real parts that are not rounded is hard. And of course, these are just cheap plastic, so they're, go they're gonna have rounds here. Uh, probably about like that looks about right. Um, do cord length and yeah that's a little more realistic looking um, probably somewhere around there uh, and the top surface is actually rounded in a kind of interesting way that I'm gonna try to recreate here um, what I would like to have is that it actually have it not be a rolling ball. Uh, can I do this somehow? Okay, so it doesn't look like I can pull this in two separate directions. I don't remember what the name of, do I set to curvature, is that how I do it? No. Uh, okay, I don't remember how I actually do this to have it be both things at the same time. Um, for what that feature is even called. I don't see it here. Okay, so we'll just... Yeah, I'll mess with it a different, in a different way. Uh, hey, Nick, we're watching your stream from within VR together. <laughs> Uh, interesting. So are you using one of the, like, I'm guessing it's one of the 2D viewer style things? Um, I did it again. I did it again. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing that all day, all night. It's just going to keep happening. Just how, how it works. Okay. Um, so I don't remember actually how to do this trick with the chamfers. Oh, okay, I remember what I do now. Okay, so if I, ch yeah, if I chamfer, sorry, fill it, um, this and go, uh, I want two distances, one of them just be like one millimeter and one of them like five. Yeah, so basically this, but I want like 0.5 and uh, five might actually be pretty good. Let's try that. And then I do a fillet on that. So I'm trying to do is kind of round the cap. Oh, didn't like that. Um, go back. What, what is it not liking here? Not liking that. Nope, not that. Uh, okay. That worked. Um, but I don't want these faces. Okay. Uh, yeah, tangent. Deselect faces. That one, that one, that one, that one. That one. And then constant chord one. Two, three. And I'll just have to creep up on the size I want. Okay, too far. Four. So there we go. Um, yeah, it looks a little weird, but you can kind of see if, especially if I turn on curvature analysis or zebra, ana zebra analysis, I guess. Um, on this, you can kind of see how it curves across the surface ish. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we have this kind of continuous curve to the top, um, which is what I was trying to do. So now I'm going to go ahead and chamfer the actual edges. Unnecessarily fancy, but 
I think it'll look good. And we just want a small radius on this. Um, I believe in this case, we rolling ball might be better. Um, do 0.5. There we go, that's about right. We have our kind of rounded button cap shape. Uh, <laughs> necessarily fancy, okay, fine. Um, I'm going to turn off the button body for a second so I can chamfer these inner edges. Sorry, not chamfer, fill it. Chamfering is flat kind. And yes, it is pronounced fillet, not fillet. I made that mistake at one point. They are different things. <laughs> point five. Okay, so we basically have this piece ready. Um, in fact, I'm even gonna go ahead and color it. So we're gonna go with a glossy black plastic, which I believe the default um, black ABS is glossy. Yes, it is. I'm gonna grab that and apply it. So that kind of makes it look invisible. Uh, maybe that's not the best thing to do. Um, we'll, we'll leave it blue for now. Uh, bring back that button. And here's where I'm gonna be a little fancy. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna create the appearance as if this button has a second layer, a millimeter within it. So to do that, I'm going to use the modify and where is my feature shell? If I do a shell on this and do a one millimeter shell uh, and hopefully don't crash fusion. Oh goodness. Uh, not sure why I did that. Okay, cancel that. Uh, I'm going to save now in case I crash fusion. Um, button. Because there is a chance I will crash fusion doing this. Uh, maybe. Also going to give this a color just so we can see it better. Um, so what I would like to do is do a modify shell on this and preferably have okay faces slash body. Can I have it select it for body instead of the face? Not that. That. Uh, and if I deselect it's not what I wanted. To. Oh no. Okay, it was it was fine. I just want one millimeter. And what this should do, if everything goes well, is there should now be an intern. Yes, okay, there is. Um, if I hit OK on that. Give it a second to calculate. If I apply a clear texture to this, so if I do. This is probably made of acrylic, so I'm gonna use clear acrylic as the, yep, there we go. You can see there's actually that second surface within it now. And I believe it is about one millimeter worth of plastic. <laughs> yes, save your projects. D do it now if you have one. <laughs> um, it, it is a thing I don't do often enough and it often comes back to make me regret it. Um, so we have an internal surface now, which is kind of what I was going for. Uh, what I would actually like to have is that surface as well as a second body. Um, but what I might be able to do, and I, I need to check if how Fusion, I think Fusion will let me do this, uh, is if I go Tools, go ahead and do a section analysis halfway through. Okay. I think I can actually color the inside separately from the outside. Although I realize now that I think about it, that's a terrible idea because that would mean it would be hard to color them. So let me not do that. What instead I will do is I will do, uh, where's the feature I'm looking for? There we go, extrude, press pull from this surface and I can now hide that analysis and bring that up. I don't think press pull is what I actually wanted. Oh, it is not happy about that, oh goodness. <laughs> I'm gonna hit cancel as soon as it lets me do that. There we go. I want to extrude, not press pull, and I want to make a new body. I'm gonna hide that analysis and instead new body. There we go. 
I want to come just up below that surface, so about 7.5, I guess. Four, three, two, three. Okay, so we have a block that's just below the surface now. Uh, and that new body should be our, let's try actually doing a, an LED surface. If I search LED here, we get different colors of LED. Uh, let's add, grab a green one. I might change this a little bit, but we'll try it out, out of this for now. I'm gonna hide that upper surface, color this green, and re-add it. And then make this glossy black like it should be. So I'm gonna save this. And the real thing, so we can't really see right now because of all these uh, tangent lines and everything like that. Um, but if everything went well, if I go over to the render tab, it's already looking better, and we hit render on this, what we hopefully should see, oh, not that render, I'm just going to do an in-canvas render, is, well, that's not too far off from what we were going for. Um, maybe not as bright as I was hoping for, but definitely not bad looking at all. Um, I realize maybe it doesn't go far enough down. Okay, and we are getting Z-banding, which is the other thing I was worried about. So basically when two geometries, uh, you can see these kind of like weird surface textures right there where there's like almost like lines there. Uh, that is Z-banding, and what, or sorry, Z-fighting. And it's basically when two surfaces are in exactly the same spot, uh, a computer doesn't know what to render there and kind of just guesses one or the other, um, which is not really optimal for this situation. So... I'm going to stop that and I'm going to go back. And there's a pretty easy fix for that. Um, all I'm going to do is I'm going to, so one thing I'm going to do is bring back the appearance panel, make that blue so I can see it. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to hide away that and, I'm, and this shape, I'm going to use press pull. I'm just going to move all of these surfaces inward, just the tiniest bit, like negative 0.01 millimeters, just something tiny just so they're not actually touching. And of course I'm gonna fillet everything because filleting makes things look better. Um, just unnecessary fillets everywhere because why not? I'll uh, just do like a point, point two, point five, point three, point three looks nice. Bring back our uh, outer surrounding and then I'm also gonna do a quick fillet of this edge and this edge just slightly um, to make them look more realistic when they are rendered because real things are not perfectly uh, sharp. So I think that should be everything to make this look more or less real um, in render. I am going to change the LED texture just a little by making it a little brighter. We're going to go for 300 instead of you can kind of see how I got brighter there, 300, uh, like 300, 200, 300. Like I'll get to like 800, it'll be very bright. So we're gonna go 300 there. I'm also going to get rid of this texture I'm not using. Save that, and let's see what render looks like. So it's much brighter now in the base render, but when we actually hit render. Ah, that's looking much more like a real button now. Uh, are we making a button? If so, what's for? So we are recreating this button here. Uh, and the many buttons, I can't show them all because some of them are invisible. I realize I'm also stuttering and the qualities probably just went down. Let me uh, hit stop on that render. Um, <laughs> so uh, there are two invisible buttons, but two of them are real. We're recreating uh, these buttons. Um, for the Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes module, uh, Simon. Um, so I'm actually about to put them in place. Yeah, I'm not printing the buttons. Uh, we're just getting them fancy looking so that we can make a nice render at the end of the day because it's fun to do that. Um, I quite like making fancy renders. 
So I guess what we should probably do is have the three that are not being lit up uh, not be brightly colored. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically duplicate this body. Um, I'm trying to remember how this works when it comes to imports. Let's find out. Um, so we'll have the green button be lit up brighter than the others. <laughs> so we have the button primitive ready. We can pop back over to our wonderful uh, fake Simon module here. <laughs> yeah, I love that game too. My, my goal is to eventually make the entire, uh, I remembered this time, late, but I remembered. Um, <laughs> uh, the goal is to eventually make the entire game physically, uh, because why not? It'll be fun. Um, so like, this is the actual size of the modules uh, in comparison to me. So it's a it's a large game, um, almost a half meter in, in width. <laughs> but uh, that's the size I went with because otherwise the stuff won't fit. Because uh, wire sequences is a nightmare uh, to make physically. Got to fit a whole like rotating cylinder and all kinds of fun there, or rotating brick and yeah, it's gonna be a fun time. Haven't fully designed that one yet. <laughs> but okay, we got button primitive. Uh, oh, it has an error. What's what's going on there? because I haven't saved a uh, file is not available at the moment. Why not? Because I'm in the render view. If I go out of that, does it go away? Save. Got to close it. Okay, maybe it's just lying to me. That happens sometimes. Okay, it's just it's just lying to me. Uh, <laughs> So I'm gonna bring out this button, okay. And I'm gonna drop it in place. So to do that, I'm gonna do tools, or sorry, uh, not, it's not under tools, it's under here, there you go. Uh, joint, I'm gonna select the, one of the faces here. So I'll go with, um, go with this one right here. I'm gonna select the same spot here and it'll snap into place. There we go. So we have our button. Go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn off joint visibility because they're annoying. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. What are you erring about? Oh, it's just angry at me because I'm simultaneously streaming and using it. <laughs> yeah, I think the reason Fusion is warning me is because it was seeing it as uh, being uh, in use for the render tab, and the render tab gets angry sometimes. So that's probably something like that. Um, so what I'm curious about here is since I can see this, can I, okay, I can't change the visibility of buttons. That is important to know. So I guess I need to make copies for the four colors of button. Also, I think this is the wrong position for that button. Maybe I think it's normally green is on the bottom. Yeah. Green is supposed to be on the bottom. So we're going to have to change that. <laughs> um, I believe it is normally blue that should be on the top. Um, and this game is sadly not technically colorblind friendly. Uh, in that sense, it, since you know which one's up, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, you can you can use top, bottom, left, right, but it's more convenient if you can see color. Um, <laughs> so we got our one button here. This will actually be blue. I'll change it in a moment. Um, but it looks like we're gonna have to make four different buttons. Which is something I was kind of hoping we could avoid, but guess that's what's going to happen. Um, so um, I'm actually going to create a new folder in my directory and move some stuff in, move these into it before I do that because uh, oh is that why it says it can't be it's not available because I can't do file editing with it? Oh, that's annoying. Um, wait, let me move that. Okay, so... Um, oh, that's why it's being angry. Okay, import new version. No, wait, that's not... Come on. Open. If I open it and I save it... No, yes, appearance. This one's supposed to be blue, so let's grab a blue LED. 
Actually, just, let's just duplicate the green LED and change it to blue. Let's see the bright color. Uh, it's just an ever so slightly cyan blue in my case. Uh, that is still very green. Why is that green? Oh, the emissivity color is set to green. Uh, okay, let's change that to blue. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to hide away the cover. Make it blue. I uh, might need to lighten that up, actually. Make it base color. Wait, why are there two blues? What's this? Oh. I think it's base color a little lighter so it matches the uh, look of the actual button. Let's be about about there. And put the cover back on. Save. Save. Can I use the primitive now? I might have to restart Fusion in a second here. Uh, we'll see. Sometimes Fusion doesn't like things. Oh no, okay, saving it fixed it. That's what I was really hoping happened. Move, into Simon Says, move. Okay, since I've moved it, what I can do is I'm going to copy this button four times and make them each different color. So rename, blue, right, can't just do that. And by the way, I'm doing that slightly off screen to the side. I keep it off screen because it has my full name and some details on it. So best not to have it visible, but uh, that's where I'm re that's why I'm doing things off screen. Uh, try putting it in rice. Uh, I feel like, I, I wish it was that easy sometimes. Uh, let's see, I want to copy. Yes. And Copy, yes. Rename. Red. Rename. Yellow. Okay. So we now have a blue button. We have a green button. We have a red button. And we have a yellow button. They're all currently blue. <laughs> so, so uh, well, let's change that. Um, <laughs> wrong thing to disappear. There we go. Appearance. So this is going to be our green button. We got our green. Save. Okay. Whoops. Turn that back on. Save. Okay. Our red button. Turn that off. Appearance. We need to make a red LED now. Um, so I'm going to duplicate the green LED. And I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to say this should be red. Advanced. Filter red. Okay. Okay. And put it on there. And it's actually pretty close to how the red LED looks. I'm actually just going to brighten up the and saturate the appearance a little more. Make it look a little closer to what the one in game looks like. Not like that. Uh, that's, uh, that's actually too bright. About there. Okay. Um, so basically, what these have two colors. They have a color that they emit, and they have a color that they are. The R color is their unlit appearance, which two of them are invisible. Um, whereas the lit color is what they'll actually glow as they're rendered. And so I have to make sure that both of those are correct for them to look look right when, so once they're actually rendered. Um, we got red, and finally yellow, appearance, I don't even think there's a yellow LED by default, so we're going to have to create one, um, actually I'm just going to duplicate that, duplicate that, yellow, yellow is a hard color to land on, let me try to get close, advanced, I think I made it a little too green, um, I'm going to use that and I'm going to turn it down a little bit. I'm going to move it to about there. Okay. And see what that looks like. Well, that's pretty yellow. I think I got it pretty close. 
I think it's actually just a little more orange than that. So I'm going to move it just a touch over to match. About there. Okay. Um, will it change the light color if the shell color is different? No. So, so the way uh, the way it thinks about it is, any light that reflects off of it is the shell color, um, or I guess the the official terms are the uh, I think it is. So basically, they have a color that they are in the actual editor, um, which is the yeah, it just calls it color. That's the color they reflect, but they actually emit light in the emissivity uh, setting, and the color they emit in the emissivity is different from can be different from the color they appear um which is maybe a little unrealistic because it's really hard to have something that emits a different color than it looks um but i guess the closest analogy would be uh i mean it, it would be a lot like if i took the uh like the blue led and stuck it behind the yellow um piece so if, all, if everything went well, which I hope it did, we should be able to have all these saved like they are. And I should be able to bring, okay, I need to update this. Uh, update, update. Let's turn blue, there we go. Um, is blue up, is that, am I correct that blue is up? Yeah, blue is up, red is left, yellow is right, green is down. So we can bring in our refresh. And bring in our other colors here. Got our red button. And move that out there. We've got our green button. And we got our yellow button. And we can just place them into position by using the joint. So joint right there. And we want that one to go into the left. Right, oh, come on, right there. There we go. And then we want green, so we'll go right there. We want green to be on the bottom, so we'll put that right, oh, come on, here, there. Like so. And finally, we want to do yellow. Go right here. Right, right, okay, come on. It's a lot of little snap points, you gotta get just the right one. There we go. Right there. There we go, we got our buttons in. They're definitely a little small. <laughs> Looking at them like this, they're definitely a little small, okay. Uh, I was a little worried about that. We, we might have to eventually upgrade to the bigger buttons, but uh, this will do for now. <laughs> So, what I'm curious about now, of course, is how does this look if we render it? Because I always like rendering. Um, let's see what happens. Hopefully we don't crash fusion. I did just save, though. <laughs> uh, really bright for some reason. Um, I may have actually rendered this before using different settings, which is probably why it's uh, so bright. Um, but I guess we will find out in a moment. Be happy with I, I do like the subsurface look of those buttons that looks nice um, I might need to turn them down a little bit they're all glowing very brightly at the moment <laughs> but maybe that looks nice maybe, maybe that's a good thing so I yeah I'd say that was a successful uh, module that, that looks pretty good <laughs> um, let's see I stop that render. Curious what half what it'll look like if I get real close. Like right up on the buttons like that. See what they look like. And I, I do not have the most powerful GPU here, so it, it definitely uh, 
Like you'll probably see me, I'm my frame rate in the little camera in the corner is going down. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that looks pretty nice. Um, they're not actually all that bright now that I look at, so maybe it is. Maybe it would be worth brightening them up a little. Um, but that, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, also, this is way shinier than this plastic should be. I need to let me let me fix that. Um, pop back into the. I think I can actually do appearance from here. Yeah, I can. Yeah, the silver PLA is way too shiny. Uh, let me turn up the roughness a bit. It's around there, I think. And reflectance down. Uh, it's not matte, but it's also not very uh, shiny. Maybe about like that. Still, Fusion's very good at rendering shiny things. It, it doesn't do quite as well in my experience so far with not shiny things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I do love the, the like renders are a fun part of this process because it, it's always nice to see something kind of how it look even if it's not perfect um, the little bit of detail you get from a render is always nice to have so I think this is a pretty good I mean so Simon really doesn't have much on it um the one in game is basically just the four buttons. They are much, much larger than these four buttons. Um, watch some VR folks listen. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I feel like ours wouldn't be all that interesting because it is so tiny uh, in human scale. Uh, I'm gonna pause that render now, and we should be able to just move that away. Yeah, there we go. Now we can see it without it uh, causing frame rate issues. But like, because this is so small, I mean, because it is literally just we're taking this uh, piece and sticking it onto like this. Mo <laughs> we're, we're doing that, uh, which this makes it look bigger in, in a way. I guess it's because the camera perspective. Um, I wonder if I can. Uh, no, there's not really a way for me to do that better. Um, but. I do, I, I'm definitely going to be printing this. Maybe, not sure if I'll be able to have it printed uh, by next stream. All that would, that would be cool. Uh, I might be able to manage that. We'll try. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to have to dry the PLA a little bit. Um, it's been wet here. It's been raining. Um, but, yeah, I think we might be able to manage having that. Um as far as the appearance between this and the real thing, I may be able to, let me see if I can get a 12 volt source here. Let me see what they actually look like when they're lit. Um, got 12 volts, I need a cable to connect to it. Oh wait, this is a this is a power modified cable. I need a different one. Uh, I think I've got one somewhere uh, sitting around here. Maybe there's one. Got a cable. <laughs> How do I draw my PLA? In a food dehydrator, of all things, actually. Um, they work just about perfectly. Um, I, I think I've never actually dehydrated food in it. <laughs> uh, it's just been for PLA. Um, let's see if I can figure out. I'm trying to remember which direction I put the positives normally. I think it's this way around. Uh, is this way? That didn't light up. Maybe it's the other way. Hmm. 
There we go. Yeah, for some reason I have them wired what looks like backwards to me. But if I can get this wire kind of threaded in, there we go. So I'll use the red one as an example. You can see there's the what it looks like when it turns on and off. So when it's actually doing it, these will be flipping on and off uh, in about that rhythm with the patterns. Um, I'm not actually sure why it, why it has that super nice like fade effect. It doesn't fade quite that fan, that nicely uh, in in real life. Um, I think it's because of the residual power circuitry in the uh, module here. Um, it will be fading out, just probably not quite like that. Uh, and I think I can do the yellow. I have a feeling both the green and the blue, if I power them, will just remain invisible. I mean, we'll see. Um, so, like, if I turn on a green light... Oh, just because... <laughs> That's such a weird effect. What? Why? Okay. Um, well, we have, a two, we have a 2D light now, I guess. <laughs> weird effect so I guess it's it, when it hits a specific brightness it kind of like the camera stops considering it white or green and considers it white instead oh what a weird effect okay I'm glad we found that that's just fun uh, <laughs> let's see if uh, let's see what the other ones look like um, okay I think I've got this one might have this one backwards uh, nope there we go so yellow Kind of a, a more of a like an almost amber look when it's lit. That's yellow, and then blue is either going to be weird and visible, or it's going to just not show up, or it might be blue. We'll see. Because I'm not technically getting rid of blue. Nope. Okay, it's weird and visible again. Although you can like see the edges of the blue retract from the because it's not the right color. Interesting. Kind of works. Yeah, it's, it's like weirdly 2D in like the wrong way. Super weird. Huh. <laughs> Green screens are always fun that way. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so the these aren't perfect recreations of that effect because technically there's a light bulb in these that's focused forward. And so in these simulations we have here, this is just like a perfect brick of light and color which is not realistic to how uh, these are being lit. Um, but I also don't know if it's really worth it to go any more realistic than what we have here, um, given these already look quite good, and they also will probably uh, break something if I uh, do much more. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's, that's a good spot for these to be. Um, eventually it will be a, th uh, I'm going to stop that. Oh, I didn't realize you can actually see like the little edges in there. That's cool. You can see that bump texture that's on the, the way the light falls. Out. Oh, right. I'm using a photography light, a fake photography setup here, which is why there's that like umbrella in the reflection. Um, so... Besides the absurd shininess of this, I'm not sure why it's just shiny. Uh, I think that's a pretty good representation of why is it, this is so much darker. What? Can I? I think there's a way to set my workspace lighting. Um, maybe not. I'll have to figure that out at some point so it's a little easier to see when I'm streaming because I know this is a lot darker than it needs to be. Um, yeah, just like the one light over there, I guess, like behind. Is the one over there too? I guess it's just the horizon. There's like the horizon and there's the one light that's almost straight up right there. Weird. I'm not sure how it decides the uh, how it decides where what the lighting is in the main uh, workspace. I imagine that 
probably, oh, I can probably see it here. Uh, no, not there. I can go home this way. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how it's deciding what to show the background is. Hmm. I know I, I, at one point I did set it to gray instead of white. I believe Fusion defaults to white, and I find that is blinding um, <laughs> when I'm working in an area like this. So I guess we have this one done. Um, I'll go ahead and go through the – I'll prepare a print because that's a fun thing to do. Um, so I'm going to go to – Tools, make quick surface. So we can see the whole geometry of what we created. Um, lots and lots of lines due to the circles. And I'm going to send that over to Mesh Mixer, I guess. I uh, don't think anything about this has changed. Yeah, this is all normal. So I'm going to send that to Mesh Mixer. And I only the only thing I do in Mesh Mixer is I just do a line to make it on the bed. Uh, that's not a game. What are you talking about? Um, and export that. Let's put it on my desktop as Simon. Save. And we can use the new one. So uh, normally I use a Prusa Slicer version. Uh, let's see what version I'm on right now. Um, and it may be angry with me. We'll find out in a moment. Uh, oh, it's in the other tab. That's why it's not. Okay. I normally use this. Oh goodness, lag. Why? Oh no. Okay. Um, no idea why there was that much lag all of a sudden. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen again. Um, <laughs> so I normally use Prusa Slicer version 2.2.0, uh, and I use a modified one called Dribbling. Um, however, uh, Prusa just came out with a new alpha for Prusa Slicer version. Oh, that's not what I wanted. That's the G code viewer. Not that. Here we go. A new version of Bruce Slicer 2.3.0 alpha. Um, and I have loaded up my printer in it. So this has a few new features that I guess we can run through uh, that I will be using for the, that I definitely will need on this print. Um, oh goodness, there's a long thing that just got written in. Uh, here we go. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with Simon Says, but since I'm currently redesigning my casing, I had to start thinking about stuff like serial number, batteries. Uh, so, out of curiosity, what do you have planned for these things already? They're interchangeable, so you can find a microcontroller. Any controls for them? Surely already have any plans on Edwork modules. Yes, I, I kind of do. Um, and I can actually grab one of my edge works, I think. I have it in here somewhere. Here we go. So for serial number, um, I'm using an e-paper display. This is backwards, ignore it, because my, my camera's backwards. Um, so it's that big. Uh, as you can see, it's not plugged in. It's still displaying the last serial number I had generated on it. Um, e-paper does not require power when it's not uh, being changed, which is a cool property of it. It also does not emit light, so it looks exactly like paper. Uh, the shininess is from the... Uh, piece of plastic I have covering the screen so I don't scratch it until I install it. Um, so that's my plan for edge work when it comes to uh, both labels and um, serial number. Uh, and I've actually converted the fonts from games. You can see this is this is almost what the game looks like besides aspect ratio. Um, both of these fonts, I believe these are Anonymous Pro and... I do not remember the name of the top font off the top of my head. Um, but you can find, I think I have it on the GitHub, and I may have it um, in, let me, let me just double check here. Um, and if I have it here, I can show you the, I can give you the code. Um, let's see. I 
Who's supporting? Uh, okay, it doesn't look like I have that code up on the uh, GitHub yet. I'll work on that. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely free to work, reach, reach out to us. Uh, also, I will just on the, uh, off the side, I'll recommend uh, if you go to the Keep Talking Nobody Explodes library, or, or sorry, Keep Talking Nobody Explodes Discord, off of their Discord is a link to the Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes IRL builds Discord. And I believe the code is posted there, um, the code I've been using for this. But yeah, my current plan is to use ePaper for the edges of the module itself. Um, along with the labels with the little indicators next to them, uh, so I can only have one or two. And then the current plan is to have them be in fixed positions uh, around the build, um, since I'm using aluminum extrusions, and then to have uh, the, yep, and then to have the physical uh, elements like, um, Let's see, what's, what's the big ones that we have? Uh, so things like batteries and ports uh, would be in little interchangeable modules that would slot into the sides. Um, probably all manual on that front. <laughs> so not, not, not a perfect system as far as making the entire game run itself, but not, I, I, I have a, I, I'm, I'm willing to intervene in every module during setup person, um, which I will have to do. <laughs> For uh, a lot of them. So, the real fancy new feature that was added in Prusa Slicer, um, what version is this? 2.3, uh, the alpha, is something that they call, and I, I want to make sure I get this right because it is new. Uh, yeah, so the top infill patterns, um, having them fixed positions, but yeah, um, I kind of agree. The idea is that hopefully it'll be modular enough so I can swap out labels and serial number positions with like, because uh, in game there are only, I believe, three positions on the top and two on the sides or something like that. Um, optimally, I would have the same positions on the physical module uh, available to my build. Um, since it is all made out of these aluminum extrusions, I can slot something into the side without too much issue. Uh, hopefully at least. Um, so that's my my goal right now. The weird thing with my build also that I should mention is that uh, currently mine is wireless uh, because I'm using ESP32s for all my chips so far. Um, I'm designing with the intent that all the modules can operate disconnected with a battery <laughs> um, if they need to, uh, which is real weird. But uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Back on topic. Um, the new thing is this new uh, infill called monotonic uh, or monotonic uh, solid fill. So we used to have rectilinear um, and in rectilinear, and I'm not sure how well it'll show this. Um, I think I, so another big change. Uh, it used to be you could scroll through your layers like this, right? Kind of the classic way you do it in a slicer. Uh, unlike Cura has had this for a while and so has Simplify 3D. But so far, Prusa Slicer and the other uh, slicers have never had this feature. Now, you can actually watch the order in which it'll print all of the geometry of a, of a single layer, which is cool. Oh, screen. Thank you. Um, so now you can actually see the order it's going to print something, which is really cool. <laughs> um, However, this actually shows the issue that is the new one that <laughs> I think it just happens to be that way. But yeah, it is kind of Halloween colors, isn't it? Orange and purple. Um, but what you can see here is that this is actually the issue we've been having for a long time with Prusa Slicer. Uh, is that, and I want to move up to the red layer here. There we go, that one. Um, is that, so if, if you look at the order, it fills these this solid surface here. It starts over here and then goes to the right, and then it goes left, and then it goes right, and then it goes left, left, right, right, left, right. Like it just kind of goes all over the place with it. And if I move to the right angle, it might become visible what's going on here. Okay, it doesn't actually, it's not visible in this. 
But when you do this for real, uh, you can actually see what happens on this print. You can actually see how like in the light, there's you can see that edge where this one was going, it was going left here and it was going right here. Going left there, like left, right. So you can actually see those when it comes to the real print. So you can see there's an edge there. Like you can, uh, as I move it in and out of the light, you can see those differences. Um, and I realize I just have this big, sorry. Uh, so you can actually see that how like this patch is a different look uh, from this patch. Like you can actually see an edge there. Um, and a lot of us for a long time have been annoyed with that because it kind of ruins the perfect flat surfaces that you would get otherwise. Um, you can even see it in these older prints like this one. If I move it just right in the light, you can probably... Uh, let's see if I can... There we go. You can see right there, there's an edge on that curve. And so this has been a thing that has been annoying for a long... Like, it's even visible on the bottom surfaces with the right lighting, uh, just barely. Um, it's It's been the bane of perfect prints for a long time. Uh, and you can actually see see it in these prints now with that new viewable layer. You can see it switching directions back and forth and where those seams would be. Uh, so, uh, in this newest bay alpha, which is the only reason I'm using an alpha, normally they're kind of risky, is because they added monotonic, which for the first time makes it all go the same direction, finally. Um, so once it finishes up the decode, it takes a little longer. Um, but once we're ready, and it's good to try it. You can see now as we go through it, it comes from, it's basically coming from that top right side. And you can see it basically, while it still jumps, so it goes this little bit, and then jumps over there, it's, it always is coming in the same direction. And it's attempting to keep those groups as close together as possible. So it's trying to basically work its way across the surface in one straight line. It's going to happen every time, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, let, let me flip it back. Um, so rectilinear infill, traditional infill. Um, that's now. Um, and so I'm going to have to keep hitting this button. <laughs> Uh, I should even notice it. The problem is I'm looking at the uh, the screen I have chat on, which only, which shows me all of my camera views, and so I can see both of them at the same time. So I just don't think about. Um, I could probably turn it off, but then then if I made a mistake, it would immediately so. Um, so you can see the order here. It kind of just starts from a random spot, and fills in, kind of just at random wherever it wants to go in different directions. Um, so the fancy new thing they added finally, which we'd been asking, I think a lot of people were asking for it for a long time, was a solution to that. Uh, their solution was monotonic infill, which I have a feeling they may have just created as a name. I, I don't know if it's uh, a thing that existed before now. Um, but I'm glad it, I think it did exist. I think it may have been in Super Slicer or one of the other uh, forks. Um, like some of the basically like heavily custom versions that the community creates. But yeah, so now in Prusa Slicer, um, it will, when it gets to that surface, so it goes around, it actually will fill in. So it fills in starting from the top right. And it basically just keeps doing that from the top right, trying to be as continuous as it can all the way over. And so no surface is ever printed going in, in the other direction, um, which takes slightly longer to print. I think that probably adds like, I'm actually curious if we can see it. So it says two hour, 30 minutes right now. If I switch the print settings so that this is, instead of monotonic, this is rectilinear. Let's see if we get any faster. Um, so 230 was the original prediction for monotonic. Um, let's see what the, time is on two minutes 30. okay so it, it doesn't seem to affect time enough to even show up 
which is probably accurate. Um, but yeah, much smoother. I'm much happier with the way this will go. And so hopefully, uh, if everything goes well, I can use monotonic on this print and get a very nice looking print for uh, the actual version. Because this is not final, but I'd say this is pretty close to what this will look like. Um, I guess maybe before I before we print and, and finish up, or before I uh, send this off and we finish up for the night, it may be a good idea for me to add something to hold the circuit board uh, once this is finished. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. So I might add some more spots for uh, something to connect to. Um, let me turn back over to feature type. Julian here, who I said to build now. Nice. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, we're finishing up in like five minutes, five, ten minutes here anyway. Um, so don't, don't worry, you're not missing much. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for stopping by. Um, it's nice to have people hop by, just say hi every so often. Um, we normally don't have all that many people showing up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so say this looks pretty good. I, I'm excited to see how this comes out when it prints. Um, I'm actually also a little curious what those buttons look like. So if I come down to this layer here, how's it going to be filling that? Okay, so it's doing nice consistent fills there as well. That's good to see. Okay. So, I think think this is ready to print more or less um, might be worth it to change how that ring is printed make that circular but besides that um, how'd that print on the real one? Oh, it did do something weird there interesting okay I might have to change that <laughs> but that came out quite well so, um, before we finish up for the night, we have a few minutes left here. Uh, let's see. So, as it is now, these four, um, and you can actually see these on the print here. There are four little holes here for uh, bra basically brass 3D printing uh, heat inserts that'll hold it with a sprue to these parts here. So, there's a sprue that goes in each corner. And that connects this uh, backing piece to it. It has the magnets, um, which is how these modules kind of fit together. Kind of convenient because I can just swap out this uh, back panel with a different one. Don't have to change the faceplate every time. But it probably means we're going to want something to attach to to have our circuitry we're going to have to put a circuit on the back of here um, at some point. So I guess the real question, where'd the, where's the buttons? The issue is these buttons are very tall. Um, you can see they stick out real far from the back. And so optimally, I feel like the electronics would be off to the side of the buttons, not directly behind them. Because uh, if I'm putting directly behind them, I mean, this module is going to be uh, literally as far back as it is wide, like they're like <laughs> almost as bad as far back. So probably it'd be best to stick the electronics like at an angle on the side. Um, kind of like almost up the wall here or something like that. Um, I'm going to have to think about that. I, I might just put hmm might be worth it to just put basically like screw holes ready here. Like maybe like two here, two on this side, something like that. Um, just so there's something to connect to in case I need it. Uh, just future proof it so I don't have to print it again. So to do that, I've got like five minutes left. I don't know if I'm going to actually get around to doing this. Um, We'll try real quick. So I'm going to hide away. Uh, oh, I can close that. Let me go bodies. I'm going to hide away that, um, that piece. 
we just have this surface now. Um, and what I would like to do is just copy this little feature bit here uh, into like four spots, two here and like two here. So um, let's think of this an easy way to do that. Uh, hmm. I don't know if there's really an easy way. Um, I can think of some sneaky ways. <laughs> so maybe that's maybe that's the best thing to do. Um, so if I was to do a rectangle, if I basically move this by doing a rectangular pattern. Uh, now nah, we, we should just draw them in. Okay. So I'm going to do bring that back. I'm gonna create a sketch on this plane. It's upside down for some reason. I still haven't figured out why it likes doing that. Um, one day I'll find out. <laughs> so I'm going to create some construction lines here. One. Uh, that works. One there. We'll do one over here. And I need to make the little circular features here. We'll probably do them right about here. That seems like a good spot. We'll do one right about here. Kind of an off construction geometry. Where's the button? There it is. And actually, I should be able to do this just with a point. Uh, we, we'll use the whole creation tool. So we'll put the point there. And the point across from it and will reflect up to there. So we're going to need to create a line for that too. Do something like, uh, I mean, arguably, all that we need is this one point. Do that. Go 40. Oh, goodness, not 403. 40. And we'll have it be, uh, probably I'd reference this, I guess. Can I reference that? I can reference that. We'll have that be uh, eight, sounds good. Eight away. Thank you. Okay, brought that in. So finish. And we're gonna use the hole creation tool. So create a hole. Click there, creates a hole. That's not, that's way too big of a hole. Um, let me fit. Let's look at what the hole I used. Here. Uh, not this hole. This hole. Let me find where the hole I'm looking at is. This hole. This hole. Look at this hole. Uh, okay, there we go. So we need eight, five point two five, four point two, three point two. Four point two five. Okay. See if I can remember that. Uh, right there. Uh, this, this, this. Eight. Five point two five. Four point two. Three point two. Did I remember it correctly? I don't remember. Um. Doesn't look wrong. But I'm going to double check that other hole, make sure I got it right. So 8, 5.25, 4.2, 3 8, 5.25, 4.2. Yep. Okay. We got it. <laughs> uh, it's all right. I, I, I normally have that written, these numbers written down because I use them a lot. Um, we can get rid of the, this piece here. Basically, we just want to recreate this weird pattern I have in there. Um, and I want to double check if I measure from here to here. 4.2. Okay, that's what I need to check. So I'm going to create a sketch inside this hole. It's fine. Uh, I'm just going to draw some lines. So one from here to here. One from here to here. One from this line to this line. And one from this line to this line. And then we use the tangent modifier to snap it. To the edge of the hole. 
like so. Let's finish. I'm going to extrude this. Oops, not that. This, 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 this. By 0.2 millimeters. Uh, is that cutting? Is that? Yes, that is cutting. Okay, okay. No, wait, that didn't cut. I want the other way around. Negative 0.2. Okay. Wait for it to process that. Oh, that's not good. Cut. Okay. There we go. And then I want to bring that back one last time. Sorry, we're right, running right up to the end of time here, but hopefully we'll be able to just kind of finish this up real quick and get rid of these holes and do another uh, negative 0.4. So double that. Cut. Okay. So now we have this kind of pattern here that allows it to be printed without supports, which is real nice. And then we just want to chamfer it. 0.5. I think it's bigger than it actually should be. 0.22. Oh wait, right. Uh, equal. Yeah, okay. I think it's 0.2. 0.2. Yep. Yeah. So we have our hole, just like that hole. And then what we can do is we can mirror it. So I'm going to select Features, this, 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 plane. Uh, if I can grab it, come on. I want that one. That. And so what that should do is, did I, did I hit the right one? No, I didn't. No, come on. Uh, let me just get rid of. Get rid of that. There we go. That one. And bring it back. Not that. So what that should do is if everything went correctly, which it may or may not have. Uh, okay, didn't didn't work. Um, we're gonna have to use move instead of adjust. So let me try that again. Here, uh, type features. It's the last three three things we did. Mirror to this mirror. I want that one, so I'm gonna have to like. Hide that away. If I click that, bring it back. And we'll do identical, I guess. And see if that brings it back. Still didn't like it. Okay, fine. I think it's the chamfer. For some reason, chamfers make it angry. So we'll do one last try. Let's try one more time. Mirror. Uh, features. These two extrude. I know why it was we weren't selecting the hole. Ah, I forgot the hole. Uh, let me cancel Control Z to bring back that. This, 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 this. Whoops. Now we can do it. Mirror features. Got to select the hole. This, 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 this. Mirror plane. Deselect. Select plane. Reselect. Just be back. Are we still not? Still doesn't want to show the hole. Uh, if I deselect that, does it make it happier? No. Really? I don't know why it's uh, being like that. Normally, if you select something like that and do uh, a mirror plane against that, that'll be fine. Well, maybe, maybe we should call her tonight and I'll just figure this out later. Because <laughs> um, it seems to not like doing that unless I... I think I have one more thing I can try. So if I do that, mirror this, 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 select. I'm going to not unselect this this time. I'm just going to actually go into the origin and select it here. That. And make sure it's at the features instead of. Uh, never really works with. Features. That, that, that. Select. That one. Yeah, normally it should pop up a little visual. Oh, you can just barely see it there. Um, is it identical? Does that optimize? Identical. 
Okay, we got the hole, finally. <laughs> um, oh, but it didn't. No, it didn't like some of it. Um, okay, we got it. We got it. Adjust worked. Um, so we have that. Last thing to do is I'm going to basically do the same thing again, but I'm going to do a rotary pattern, circular pattern. I'm going to select the features that we just made. So the hole, this, this, and this. Axis, the blue one. I'm going to do two. So there would be another copy over there. But we're not going to do full. We're going to do angle, and we're going to set it to 90. Uh, sorry, negative 90. Just going to put one copy over here. We're going to try adjust and hope it works. And hey, it worked that time. So we got our four holes, finally. I can bring back this. Do it quick. Chamfer of 0.2 millimeters. And we're done for the night. Okay. <laughs> That, uh, that took more effort than I was hoping it would. Normally, it's not that hard to make holes. Um, so, I guess that's the stream for tonight. <laughs> um, so, we might uh, pick this up tomorrow night. I might try to do another module. We'll just have to see how things work out, I guess. But, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, making this is always, it's always fun to mess around with uh, Cat again. So, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. And uh, have a good night. See ya.